welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Sometimes we, sometimes we don't understand that we come into a place like this and you can literally feel the presence of God. And you need to know it's simply called the anointing. We spend hours and days in books trying to explain the anointing. One preacher said one time, I don't know what the anointing is, I just know when it's not there. The anointing is simply the presence of God on you. That's simple. We came into this place today. We sang the songs. We saw the production. We heard the music. And the presence of God fell on many of you. Your heart was moved. And you were touched. And your thoughts started to go in a direction that some of you think is unusual and strange. You may not even have really wanted to go to that place, but the anointing keeps the presence of God, keeps pulling you to that place. And that's what you just experienced in the house of God is the very presence of God in this place. Let's capture the moment for your life. There are many of you that are in here right now today that need to stop carrying the baggage that you've been carrying. The weight of life, the issues of life, the pains and hurts of life. And you need to give that to Jesus. And you need to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You need this morning, and God brought you here. This is a divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life with plumbers and preachers and teachers and dentists and doctors, but this is one with God. It's a divine appointment, and God brought you here so that his very presence would draw you to him so you can make the wise decision to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's what this is all about. Today, right now in this place, there are many of you that need to give God all of your heart and your life. And when you do that, the Bible describes it as becoming born again. And then you can take the baggage that you've been carrying, the issues, the pains and the hurts of the past, those things that you don't know how to deal with, and cast them on he that careth. And there's only one that cares more than anyone else who went to the cross, a beaten bloody mess for you died on that cross, rose from the third day so that you could have everlasting life. So you don't have to carry the baggage of life. You don't have to carry the issues. You can throw it at the cross and leave it with him. He can handle it. And today, God has got this timing for you. It's time today to get right with God. Getting right with God means you're going to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. No one can steal that from you. No one can take it from you. No one can make you do this. It's your heart and it's your life. And here you are in this safe and friendly place. And today is your day of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. In order to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life, Jesus makes a statement. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. And here we are in this place today, and it's time to make that profession, to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Today is your day. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and you'll hear this sound. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. 
And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans because we all know who Jesus is. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know who he was. We all celebrate Christmas every year of your life. You know who Jesus is. But listen to what I'm going to say to you. The devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head. Look at me now. Look at me. It's about what you've done in your heart. Given him all of your heart. Given him all of your life. Being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. I'll make it so simple for you today. I'll not ask you to come out of the aisle. I'll not ask you to come in front. I'm only going to ask you in a moment when you hear my hands pop together, bang, your hand goes up. And I'll see your hand making a public confession. I need Jesus. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again. And right where you're at, right where you're at, not even having to move, I'll pray with you. The entire congregation will pray a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart and into your life. But keep in mind, Jesus said, if you deny me, I'll deny you. So you need to make that public statement of Jesus Christ in your heart. You can't just sit there and stare at me. Today it's too deep, it's too real. His presence is on you and you need to come home been running from God instead of to God I'm speaking to you get ready to put your hand up if you've never given him all of your heart I'm speaking to you get ready to put your hand up if you've never given him all of your life get ready I'm I'm speaking to you get ready to put your hand up if you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure I'm not sure if I've really ever given him all of my heart I'm not sure if I've really given him all of my life you know I, I've always known him. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. I've always done, tried to do good things, but I'm not sure if I've really given him my heart and life. You know, he won't steal it from you. It's your heart and life. You're going to have to give it to him. Then you get ready to put your hand up too. All across this auditorium, it's your call. It's your choice. Hands are already getting ready to go. Get up and, and hold on. We'll do it all at the same time. I'm going to count to three. Then you let me see your hand and put it right back down. We'll pray together. That's it. Couldn't get any simpler. Are you ready? Here it is. Here it is. It's your time. Don't miss it again. It's your opportunity. Let's dump the baggage at the cross of Jesus. Today is your day of salvation. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. Somebody's got both hands up. Hold on. We'll, we'll only count you once, though. 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 90, 91, 92, 93. In the family room, man, there must be another uh, uh, eight, uh, 10 in there. 93 is 103, 103, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh my goodness, 10, 11, uh, my goodness, 12, 13 right here in front, 14, 15, 16, thank you, God bless you, 17, 18, 19 right here in front, uh, 20, 21, 122, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, thank you, God bless you, anybody else, 28, 29, 130, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 130, thank you, Jesus. Now here's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you, and I want everybody in the room to say it out loud. I'll go slow, I'll just as slow as I can go, and you follow me. Is that okay? Everybody in the room, bow your heads, close your eyes. Even those of you that didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have prayed this prayer, all 130 some odd of you, everybody together. Everybody say these words. Say, Father God, now, come on, say it like you mean it. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. I believe 
You sent him for me. I believe he died for me. I believe his blood washes away my sins. I repent. I turn from evil. And I turn to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known this day and for the rest of my life, I am born again. I am a Christian. I am a child of God. I have the victory. Thank you, Lord. I'm free. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. Now give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's so great. Now, let me, let me just do this. Let me get down on my knees and pray. You can stay seated if you want today because you've already been on your feet a little bit longer. Or if you want, you can stand. Uh, you can do anything. You can lay down on the floor, roll around, do whatever you want. To. I don't give a flip. But let's go put our hearts before God. Is that okay? I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Wow, Lord, we have already had church here at The Rock. We are grateful, Father, for what you have done already in the hearts and lives of your people. We thank you, Father, for a great harvest in this place. Now, Lord, as we come before the word of God today, we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man, old man, young man, black man, white man, brown man. We haven't come to hear from, we, we have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Will we just say, Holy Spirit, welcome. Here's our hearts, fill it with your way and your word and your desire and your plan. We'll give you the praise as you bless us today. Now, Lord, as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Old Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for the way. We thank you for Emmanuel Baptist. We praise your name, Lord, for our Catholic brothers and Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, we lift up the Pope to you. What a responsibility he has. I thank you, God, that he's got a heart for Jesus and he's going to take 1.2 billion people and and fire them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're praying for that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We ask you to bless them. And we thank you, Father, that at no time do we see ourselves as better than anyone else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Some of you may be angry with me blessing and praying for the Pope. <laughs> Just shut up. <laughs> and who are you to judge another man's servant? Yeah. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 4. So I learned that lesson the hard way. Now I bless everybody and let God straighten out the church. Are you hearing me? It works a whole lot better. So just shut up and let's go to the Word. Anybody interested in the Word of God today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I want to share this with you. It's a wonderful message. It's called The Elementary Principles of Christ. If you're making notes, it's part one. Part two is after Easter. Part three is after that time. Part is after part two, after Easter. And uh, just wanted to share it. I want you to concentrate with me as we go to the Word of the Lord today. And I'll share with you how important it really, truly is is. We've been talking between four and six verses, it depends on how you interpret those verses, about a subject called maturity. Maturity, let me say this, hear me now, ought to be the goal of every Christian on the planet. Maturity is not growing old. Maturity is not getting wrinkles on your face or gray hair. Maturity is not being around a long time. Maturity is not, you know, being educated or going through a bunch of principles that are worldly. 
That is maturity in the world. But maturity in the Bible is completely different than maturity in the world. The Bible standards are different than the world standards. And so when God talks about maturity, he's talking about his standards, his method, his understanding of the word maturity. Maturity is this, is how you live your life according to the word of God. If you don't live your life according to the word of God, you live your life according to your own impulses and ideologies, philosophies and feelings, your own heart's passions instead of God's passion, God's heart. And what happens is you stay an amazingly but maybe a very immature person. But to be an amazing Christian person, you're going to have to live your life according to the word of God. That's why I can look at Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke, as young as they are, they're mature because they live their life according to the Word of God. They make decisions based on the Word of God. That's why Jesus, at 12 years old, could go into a temple and argue theology and debate theology with those that have been around for many years that are much more senior in years than him. But at 12 years old, he was more mature than them because he lived his life according to the Word of God. Maturity is the goal for all of us. Learning how to live by the passions of God, the will of God, the heart of God, the direction of God, all that God would have for us. How we raise our kids, how we run our children, how we live for our children, how we have marriages, how marriages work, how we deal with our bosses and our families, how we deal with our friends and relatives, how we deal with politicians and how we deal with life in general, how we deal with the economy. Everything is based on how you approach life according to the Word of God. When you get the Word of God, if you don't know the Word of God, and here's the question, if you don't know the Word of God, here's the truth. You're going to find yourself dealing with life according to your heart instead of his heart. And that makes you immature and keeps you immature all these days. I'm going to read to you out of the sixth chapter, which is an amazing miracle in itself, monumental that we're going into the sixth chapter of Hebrews. Verse number one, who talks about the four to six previous verses on the subject of maturity. Keep in mind, there's no chapters and verses when the original text was written. It was written and put in there by the translator so that you and I could get a picture of an understanding where to find something. So the translator makes it very clear. This is chapter 6, verse number 1. Still talking about the same chapter. Uh, still so talking about the same subject as chapter number 5. So as we look at Hebrews, the 6th chapter, verse number 1, it starts off with the word therefore. Remember, therefore is there for a reason. Because of what he just said. But he goes on and he says the next word leaving. He doesn't say camp. He doesn't say stay. He doesn't say, you know, gather ground. He doesn't say accumulate. He says leave. Can I just make a point about the word leaving? You can't leave something unless you're into something, unless you're there with something. So he is saying you've got to leave a certain spot and get rid of the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ. In other words, leave the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ. And then he says, let us go. So he says, leave one thing and go, here's where you're to go. Now watch this, let us go on to perfection. You see the word perfection? Circle it in your Bible. If you look at your footnotes in your Bible, the word perfection means maturity. Maturity is what? Hear me again. It's how you define life and how you follow what the Word of God has to say is whether or not you're mature or not mature. It is not based on how many verses you can quote. It's not based on whether you know Jesus and are saved. It's not based on whether you can be a theologian, whether you can sing songs or been in church all of your life. It's based on whether or not you determine the directions for your life based on the Word of God. You leave the elementary principles of Christ and he says to go, listen to this, to the maturity or a place of maturity. Not lying again. See the words not lying again? He's talking about this foundation that he's talking about. And I, Deborah and I have a business. We're, we're, we're getting ready to start a construction project just even as early as maybe next week. There'll be foundations laid. 
Wouldn't it be horrible if all I did was pour a foundation and then come back and pour another foundation on top of that foundation and then pour another foundation on that foundation and then look at it and say, wow, I think I'll build another foundation. The purpose of a foundation is to build the walls. The purpose of the foundation is to put the roof on there and to make life great because life becomes great when you become mature. Life becomes blessed. There are rewards in life when you become mature and your house is built on the word of God. Are you following me? And you're following the word of God. So he comes along and makes a statement. He says, not lying again, the foundations. And then he gives us six things. Six very important things that most people in American churches assume, let me say it one more time, most people in American churches assume they know what these six things are that prove their fundamental rights of, you know, 101 Christianity. These six things, if you know them, then you can go on in maturity. Here are the six things. He says this, uh, repentance from dead works and faith towards God, number two. Verse number two. He says, from the doctrine of baptisms, uh, just, just for fun, a lot of times when you read your, uh, your commentaries, it'll talk about the doctrine of baptism, not baptisms. Notice the S at the end. That one's gonna be fun when we get in there. You're going to see some interesting things. And he says, and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, all of which are the six foundational things that we're supposed to leave behind and move on in maturity. But in order for us to leave them behind and move on to maturity, verse 3 comes in. Verse 3 is like this bizarre verse that says you're not going anywhere until God sees that you can function and understand the basis of these six things. So in verse number 3 it says, and this we will do if, big word, if God permits. So in other words, I can go on to maturity not just because I want it, it ought to be my goal, but I'm going to have to be something of understanding. I'm going to have to realize some things in Scripture. I'm going to have to start living my life by some basic things, foundation, and I have to know what they are in order for God to take me to maturity. Now watch me. In maturity is blessings. Let me say it again. In maturity, God can trust you with blessings. Now, as I read through that, all of you have a little idea about all of these things. It's really fascinating. Let's go back. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about two things in part number one, two things in part number two, and two of the basic foundations in part number three. But today, two things. We're talking about eternal principles of Christ. Here's number one, repentance from dead works. When I'm reading commentaries, it's so amazing. People who write commentaries, you would think, would be mature and understand the word of God. Wouldn't you think that? I would think that. And when I'm reading commentaries, I find so many of them that did not understand what was really being said. And their commentary is about repentance from sin unto eternal life. And that's just as far as they went. Repentance from sin unto eternal life. And that's as far as they went. And I'm like reading a commentary and I'm wanting to yell at the book and say, why don't you read the verse? It's as simple as realizing what it says. It doesn't just say repentance from sin unto eternal life. It says repentance from a very definite part of the existence of a Christian from dead works. And most people that call themselves Christians don't even understand this simple basic principle. Yet we want to go on in maturity. Yet we think of ourselves as mature people because we've been around a long time. But how can we go to maturity if we don't understand even the basics of what he's saying? And it says repentance not just from our sins to, if you will, unto eternal life. Repentance means this. I'm going in this direction. I stop and I turn around, I repent, and now I'm going in a completely different direction. 
In other words, there was a time when I was going in one direction with dead works. And now I need to turn around and go in another direction with God's works. And there's a big difference between that which is dead and that which is eternal. And my lifestyle cannot express that which is dead. Being a Christian, I need to turn around and make my life express that which is eternal. Is anybody listening? And a lot of times we don't understand this principle. We think if something's good, God's in it. Can I tell you something? What the world claims to be good, oftentimes God's not in it at all. That's a shock for a lot of people. You know, what ecology tells us and what, if you will, the, uh, uh, those out there, the economists tell us and what the politicians tell us and what the majority of people try to beat down our throat all the time. Can I tell you, they say it's good. I want you to know something. God may not be in it at all. And if we don't repent from what we think is good and get into what he says is good, we're in the dead works. Let me give you an illustration. You may like this or may not like this. You may understand it or not understand it. I could have a billion dollars. And buy a billion dollars worth of computers and give them to people for education. And would not be pleasing to God. It'd be dead works. I could have another billion dollars and I could feed the poor. And all I would have is fed poor people. They die and go to hell. What good is that? I could clothe them with another billion dollars and they'd be the best dressed, best fed poor people on the planet. And they die and go to hell. What good is that? Jesus says, what good is a man if he inherits and, and everything in the world and dies and goes to hell, loses his soul. My goodness. What we do has got to be eternal. Efforts all the time that we put out there that we think is good, oftentimes if it doesn't have eternal value, maybe at a time when it helps somebody for that moment, and that's okay. That's pleasant. It's wonderful. But can I tell you something? It's not where you live. Where you live is what's eternal. When I produce something eternal that lasts, then I produce what God wants and not what I just want or what the world just thinks. Is anybody listening? And when he makes his statement, repentance from good works, that means I get out of it. And there's a whole lot of Christians that are into good works, but they're not eternal works. They don't produce eternity in the life of somebody. Are you following me? They produce good works according to society or our social system, but doesn't produce good works in the life of people. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, is an interesting subject. Paul writes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You need to go there and let's check it out for ourselves. In 1 Corinthians, as he writes to the church at Corinth, he makes a statement that's amazing about our efforts in life. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, if you got your Bible, it started in verse number 10. Paul writes these words, according to the grace of God which was given unto me, as a wise master builder, stop right there. In other words, he's a wise master builder and the grace of God was given to him to build. He says, I have, listen to these words, laid the foundation. We're talking about foundations that are not supposed to be laid over and over again. He laid the foundation. What's the foundation? Listen to this. And, and other builds on it. Do you see the part that says the others build on it, a uh, 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 foundation, and another builds on it? I should have highlighted, and another builds on it. You know that that another's not just another apostle, it's you and I. And we're building on some kind of foundation. Instead of laying the foundation over and over again, we're going on doing something with our lives that is eternal. But then he warns us, and he says, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. 
In other words, you and I are supposed to pay attention on how we live our life. And what are we building on? And what are we doing? And why are we doing what we're doing? And what we're doing is it eternal. Then he comes along, verse number 11, he makes this statement in verse number 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Foundations, Jesus. You're gonna lay that foundation over and 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 over again, never building the walls, never building the roof, never building the protection. Are you just gonna keep, you ever gone to a church that's all they preach is the same foundation over and over and over again? No one ever, they go through ceremonial rituals, they go through traditions. They're always into ceremonial rituals and traditions of men laying the same foundation over and over and over again, never building. You know why people give you ceremonial rituals and traditions because they don't think they can trust you with the walls and the ceilings. And literally for thousands of years, a man's been stuck in ceremonial rituals and suspicions of men and living superstitial lives with God because then no one believes they can, you can do this. But here God tells us to do it. No other foundation. Verse number 12, let's take a look. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, see, you can build, and now he doesn't talk about what it is you build. He talks about the value of what it is you're building with. The value, for an example, is either gold, silver, or precious stones. Then he says a different complex a group of uh, settings, wood, hay, and stubble are uh, straw. So you're going to build something that has some kind of value in your life. It's going to be either something that's going to last or something that's not going to last. Now he comes along and makes this statement in verse number 13. Listen to this. Each one's works becomes clear for the day of de will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's works on what sort it is. And then he goes on in verse 14, if anyone's works which he has built on it endures, it will receive a reward. Now listen to this. If it's gonna be revealed by fire and I'm building gold, silver, or precious stones, it will endure and last forever because fire won't hurt it. But if I build with wood, hay, and straw, when the fire hits it, bang, it may be good to the people around you. It may be good, bang, to society. It may get recognition by the newspapers and people. You may be patted on the back for your good deeds, but it isn't God. The fire will display it, and it will burn up because it's wood, hay, and stubble. So my job is to repent from the wood, hay, and stubble. Don't waste my time there and get into something building that is eternal that's going to last. Because when it endures, he will receive a reward. Which means if it doesn't endure, there's no reward. It may be fun and people may get recognition and people may pat you on the back and think you're pretty cool, but pff, God says, it ain't gonna work. Are you following me? You gotta get the picture. God's here for society. Society doesn't dictate to God. Are you following me? And verse number 15 comes along and makes it, if anyone works is burned up, he suffers loss, but he himself is saved yet as through fire. In other words, can I say something? Your salvation is not based on what you do. It's based on the grace of God. But what we do while we're here should be eternal in order for the to be everlasting and get a reward. And my job is to repent from doing things my way and turn around and start doing things God's way. Is anybody listening? Are, are, are you following me? Listen to what it says. You're right there in Corinthians anyway. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Verse number 58. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, verse number 58 says these words, which are just powerful words. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, he's talking to the brothers, 
Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in your work and what you think things ought to be, how it ought to be, what everybody says you should do. Does this your Bible say that? Wait a minute. Are you there this morning? Does your Bible say that? No. The answer to that is no. Let's try it again. Does your Bible say that? No. It doesn't. This is a steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because it's eternal. Yeah. Listen to this. Knowing that your labor is not in vain. Notice how I didn't stop there. Could have stopped. Your labor is not in vain. If he stopped there, it could be your labor in anything. But he defines clearly what your labor ought to be like. In the Lord. Making it very clear there's no escaping. Repentance from dead works. We do a lot of good things that aren't good to God. And growing up is when you realize people hit me up all the time. You want to give it? And I do. I do. I give. You know, I want to be nice. I want to be friendly. I give. But man, I tell you where I major give is when it changes people's life eternally. See, repentance from good works. Invest my life. I invest my life. Every singer you saw today, every person that put on that play, that production, invested their time and their life in eternal rewards. That was not just a song to please us. It was a song that's won hundreds of souls already today. Are you following me? So it's an eternal reward. So what they did with their life is they didn't just produce something that's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. They produced something that produces in heaven gold, silver, precious soul. Anybody listening? Man. And that's, that's just number one. Repentance from dead works. But see, we want to go on in maturity. Don't even understand what's being talked about. Even the ones that wrote the commentaries didn't understand it. That's what blew me away. I would think people who write commentaries ought to have some kind of maturity. They need to be slapped. <laughs> Sorry. I repent for all of that stuff later on, in case you were wondering, you know what I mean? That part's not God, it was me. That was just my flesh coming out. That was wood, hay, and stubble. The gold is, will silver and precious stuff, we'll bless them anyway. Number two, we're talking about elementary principles of Christ in order that God would permit us to go on. It's faith towards God. It's not easy. I mean, you stop and think about it. You're going to put your trust, your confidence, your future, your faith in a God you haven't heard from, a God you never saw, a God about stories in a book, you got to be kidding me. Faith is not easy. Yet the Bible makes this statement that drives me nuts. The just shall live by faith. I hate faith. You know why? Because I'm just like you. I want to see it. I want to understand it. I want to know how it works. I want to calculate where it's coming from. I want to see how it's going to work out. I want my math to work out to everything. God's math is completely different than my math. I don't even understand the, the, the math that makes and creates the universe. And yet I've got to believe in it when I don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't know it. In fact, to be honest with you, the more I know about God, the less I know about God because he's so great. I think I know everything and all of a sudden he shows me a part of stuff I don't even understand. It's amazing. Faith. Believing in a God I don't know and see and hear. But I don't know why there's just something on the inside of me 
that says he's in me, he'll take care of me, he'll provide, he'll make a way, he'll open doors, he'll close doors, he raises the dead, opens the blind eyes, he's the one that opens the deaf ears, he's the one that opens the deaf mouth, he's the one that makes it all happen, he walks on the water and he creates the heavens and the earth, he's my God and somehow I'm hooked to him. And it doesn't make sense. But if you're looking for sense, then invest your time in some politician. Because it doesn't make sense either. But they'll make you think it does. With God, he's got a track record. And I love it. Did you know there's no other way to please God except by faith? I mean, you can do anything you want to do. I can sing. I can dance. I can shout. But what God's looking for is me believing in him. No matter what comes against me that's contrary to my thinking and contrary to my feelings, contrary to my knowledge, contrary to my own evaluation, And it comes and all of a sudden it doesn't make any sense at all. But God, whatever's in your heart, that's what I want to do. And that's faith. I love the word of God. It says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 6. It says, but without faith it is impossible. Impossible. Without faith it is impossible. What God is looking for from you and I. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is the part I hate. The evidence of things not seen. I want to see it. I want to figure it out. I want to understand how it works and where it's coming from. But faith says I don't see anything. I just know that I know that I know. Guess what? I, if I saw it, then I wouldn't have to have faith because then I would know it. But God says, you're not going to see it. You're just going to believe me in there. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No other way to please God. You face your business, guess what? You're only going to do it in faith. You're going to stand. You're not going to give up, quit. You're not going to back down and stop. Here's how it's going to work. You're going to stand there and believe that God is going to open doors no man can open. And today may have been a bad day, but tomorrow will be a great day because I've got God on my side. That's what this is all about. Believing God for great things is you got a great God. You can do it. If you come to him, you must believe that he is. He is what? He is God. Creator of the heavens and the earth. And he that is, and that, and that he is a rewarder. I love the word rewarder. Remember gold, silver, precious stones? Get a reward. Wood, hay, and stubble? No reward. He's a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. There's a story Debbie and I have been talking about a lot lately. Crazy story. It's actually a story about you. It's found in 1 Samuel, the 14th chapter. Let me explain it to you and then I'll read it to you. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to 1 Samuel, the 14th chapter. Saul is the first king of Israel. He's a bad king. He has a son by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan is good friends with the future King David, one of the greatest kings Israel has ever known. Jonathan, Saul, and the armies of Israel are at battle with the Philistines. Philistines are the bad guys. There are tens of thousands of professional soldiers on a plateau on a hill. Thousands of them. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, let's go. God can do anything. If I was the armor bearer, I would have said to Jonathan, okay, I'm on your side, let's go. How many men do you want me to muster up to go with? 
10,000, 20,000? He doesn't. He says to his armor bearer, this young boy, let's just the two of us go. God can win by two as well as he can by 20 million. You say, Pastor Tim, how has that got to do with me? It's like Jonathan is Jesus and we're the armor bearers. And we have to follow this voice that sometimes is crazy to us. If I was the armor bearer, I would have said, hold on, dude. I want you to get the picture, Jonathan. I'm carrying your armor. There ain't nobody carrying my armor. And let's understand something, Jonathan. It's you and me against those professional murdering trained soldiers. And we're in a weakened position because we're going up the mountain. They're already on top of the mountain. All they have to do is throw rocks down on us and kill us. And you want me to go with you. Here's what I would have said and so would you. Forget it. It doesn't make sense. Faith will never make sense. You just know that you know that you know that you know. Let's read it. I'll show you what he says. It's really cool. If you will, the 14th chapter, 1 Samuel, verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, stop right there. Notice that the young man doesn't have a name. No name. He didn't say his armor bearer, John. You put your name in there. There's no name because your name goes in there. So Jonathan is never, ever, this great man of faith, this armor bearer, has never got a name. And in 1 Samuel it says this, and Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison, not, not just a few people, a garrison of those uncircumcised. Stop right there. See the word uncircumcised? Do you know what he just said? Let's go up to these people that are our enemy. They have no God. We have God. And that's exactly what David said when he faced the, Goliath the giant. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God? Uncircumcised meaning this is a man who has no God. We've got God. That's got to be your attitude and my attitude. I face a world that's mean and ugly and I don't know how I'm going to navigate through it. But I'm here to tell you something. I want you to know what I'm going by. I'm a person who has God. They don't have God. They better get out of my way. It may be that the Lord works for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Watch this in verse number seven. So his armor bearer said to him, here's, here's Jim as the armor bearer, okay? Forget you, dude. Ain't no way I'm going up there. Forget it, man. That's like totally stupid. Here's what the armor bearer says, because this is what people of faith act like. Do all that's in your heart. Go then and I am with you according to your heart. Faith comes along and says, listen, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, but you spoke it, God. So let's do what's in your heart, not what's in my heart, and I'm with you. Whatever's in your heart, I'll follow your heart. Faith towards God. Two things today, my friends. Number one is repentance from dead works. Number two is faith towards God. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? Thank you, Jesus. 